from the beautiful city of Toronto in Canada. He has been a speaker in several of our conferences because he is a true cross-industry leader when it comes to artificial intelligence and its applications and data science in general. So it's a real honor to have Bill Wong with us. Bill, in his current role, he's the AI and data analytics practice leader working for Dell Technologies and responsible for Canada. He has been directly involved with a number of public and private institutions to help them define their artificial intelligence strategy and deploy a platform to accelerate business insights. He has authored a number of books on advanced analytics, including a book focused on bioinformatics, a quarterly AI newsletter, and a contributing author with university researchers for a paper that's currently under review on how data science algorithms can accelerate drug discovery. Bill, it's always a pleasure and a gift to have you here with us, sharing your expertise, and on behalf of our global community, we're very thankful for your time. Well, thank you, Jose, and thank, thank you for inviting me. Hi, folks, uh, welcome. Uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And what I'm gonna do is um, take you through this presentation that I just built and uh, talk about the, uh, the this merge, um, this leveraging of process science and data science. So uh, I find it's a really exciting area. It's still kind of new, which uh, makes itself uh, a very interesting area to spend time uh, with customers. Okay, so uh, here's the agenda. Give you a quick overview on digital transformation efforts. Most of the studies that I'll be sharing with you have been um, done by Dell or sponsored by Dell. Then we'll talk about um, process mining and I'll give you a primer on what's behind the curtain on how process mining leverages data science. And then talk about lessons learned from data-centric organizations. And I know everybody's well-versed on the process side, but there are a lot of parallels that um, and uh, experience we can draw from looking at the data side. Uh, first, uh, a couple things about um, Canada before we start. Uh, you see here uh, on the screen here, these countries, some of the small countries like US and China, United Kingdom uh, are well known for AI. And, um, and, uh, and then fourth, uh, Canada's actually been acknowledged as a worldwide leader. And, and why is that? Um, uh, on the right-hand side here, what you see is uh, we're the very first country to announce and to fund a national AI strategy. So we have a number of centers across Canada helping companies, startups uh, get into the AI world. And uh, some of the names you may have heard, if, if you follow this field a, a lot, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, Yashua Benjo, Yala Kuhn, all cut their teeth in, in Canada. And major uh, research, major um, products have been spawned from uh, these Canadian researchers. So we're big in AI. Uh, and like most things, you know, we, we do keep a low profile. But uh, don't be surprised, uh, as you see in the comment here by the economist, that a lot of things, a lot of the research that, that you're looking at um, have Canadian authors. Uh, this is a survey that Dell does uh, every two years. And so this is the third iteration that I'm reviewing here. Uh, not surprisingly, digital transformation, we've seen a lot of efforts accelerated through the pandemic. Um, everybody at home, everybody getting digitized. And when you take a look at the uh, top five programs here, not surprisingly, uh, cybersecurity is still very, very important, e even without the pandemic, working uh, remotely. Um, but uh, we come to step four, using data in completely new ways. More and more people are looking at data and how to leverage that data and process mining as part of that to drive competitive advantage. Now, while driving for competitive advantage is a good thing, this is not an easy task. And here's the top three barriers. 
I should mention that uh, the survey that we did is a worldwide survey, uh, 4,200 sea level executives uh, across North America, Europe, Asia, uh, South America as well. So in getting access to data, uh, one of the top concerns is uh, privacy, security. That's always something to be um, respected and should be designed into applications. Budget uh, was, was a, a barrier for some people. I kind of have a philosophical view about budget. I see sometimes that really that's enough. Uh, really, it's leadership. If you don't have somebody leading and trying to make data more democratized, then budget gets in the way. But number three, uh, time and time again, we see this as one of the top barriers to analysis is the ability to actually uh, extract that data. There are a lot of technical challenges and business challenges as well that we'll talk about. Now, try to become more data-driven. And as you do this, trust me, this will help you model business processes better. But it's not an easy thing. Um, most organizations, if they've been around for 10, 20 years, have multiple legacy systems, which are incredibly diff difficult to, to change. Um, um, and, and here are some motivations here. There's a quote here um, that's, that's said often is that, that companies in, this, in the industry that are more data-driven typically are more profitable. Stock price is higher. Um, and case in point, it's difficult to become this. It, the whole thing is, is a, not a technical challenge, but a, a cultural challenge. Um, I get the opportunity to talk a lot of C-level executives. And uh, I don't know if there's anybody from the construction industry, but my guess out there is no. <laughs> because, uh, I've, I've spoke to one C-level executive and basically he told me, you know, how we make decisions here, it's a more of a kind of a, a essentially a, a gut feel. Uh, they have a good sense of what's going on all the time. And this this company was over 10 billion, and they they use analytics basically just for simple reporting, and that's it. So if you have uh, that kind of perspective <clears throat> at the C level, um, very difficult to get any kind of um, data-centric kind of initiatives off the ground. The culture is just simply not there to support it. So uh, from a process-based perspective, here are some of the major processes that you see in any company. Finance, ERP, CRM, HR, all companies have these things. Now, when it comes to leveraging data, uh, as you can see, most everything is siloed here. And a lot of the legacy applications, so they're, they're locked in these silos. Now, when we try to leverage data from an enterprise perspective, and, and let's say you have processes that span across lines of businesses, very difficult to get at that data. Um, so that, that is a key challenge that, that remains. Uh, this survey, and I'll share some of the results here throughout the presentation, is something that was released this year that we asked um, Forrester uh, to do for us. And, and what they did was um, surveyed a number of global institutions and they asked, all right, um, how do you consider yourself in terms of your data readiness for digital transformation? And if you take the uh, data enthusiasts, data novices and data technicians, that's 88% of the people there are not data champions, meaning that they're being held back today because the culture's not there, the skills aren't there, or the technology's not there. So uh, plenty of opportunity to, to improve here. So I thought I'd kind of compare uh, a lot of the process-based technologies and AI, and then take you behind the curtains about uh, what we call data science. Um, and I I've worked in the past, I I've been, uh, when I was at IBM, I worked in development. And while I was on the AI side, I would talk to developers who were doing BPM and RPA, and we kind of compare notes on how we do things. And so I came up with this kind of comparison. The, the thing is, uh, I would say 
we're still in the infancy. And I, I don't look at these technologies as, you know, BPM versus RPA versus AI. These can be very complementary and I'm starting to see RPA applications leverage AI. And while RPA is really kind of the mimicking of human uh, actions, tasks, think of AI, we're trying to mimic human intelligence, decision-making. Now, um, as I was building this presentation, I wanted to kind of show how complementary uh, data science is with process science. So I found this slide I thought, wow, this is one researcher who kind of kind of put it together, kind of same perspective. And then I did some research on this person um, and it's referenced down below. It's in his uh, second book. I didn't realize that the uh, Vander asked, he's considered the godfather of process mining. So um, if you have a chance, read the book, it's great. Uh, it does, and he positions process mining as the link between process science and data science. And I'm gonna take you to the data science side. So why all the hype? Um, if you survey uh, C-level executives, you'll find that analytics AI are right up there as the top areas investment for what are we gonna to do to differentiate our services and offering in the industry. So that's why there's a lot of attention. And currently AI is the fastest growing um, data center workload out there. Another reason for the focus in AI is there isn't one industry that remains kind of untouched. Although maybe construction will be one of those industries. Uh, I'm sure there are kind of leading edge construction firms that are looking at AI to let's say improve supply chain. I spent a lot of time in healthcare, <clears throat> but uh, starting to spend a lot time in financial services. They're probably one of the leaders when it comes to using new technology. <clears throat> Excuse me, but every industry has an opportunity to, to leverage AI. And these are just some of the use cases. Uh, one thing I should also mention about AI is uh, there's also been a lot of hype. Some companies, which I'm not gonna call out, have said like this, this thing can do anything. And when it comes to investments, a lot of people, uh, rightly or wrongly, will say, well, you know, we'll get this approved because it's AI, let's not focus on these other kind of traditional technologies. So let me be the first to say that not everything, not every business problem, not every optimization problem is uh, looking for an AI solution. Uh, that, that's one of the first things I asked. Do you really need AI? Can you use conventional analytics? Is it something that is available through existing enhancements to your, your BPM or your RPA tools? So I, I do not advocate that you, know, you, you must use AI, but there are definitely things that are well suited for it. So um, you may or may not have seen this, but a lot of these terms are also used in process mining as well. If you take a look at the evolution of analytics, uh, from the bottom left-hand corner, uh, we have um, what we call descriptive analytics, where um, it's really looking into the past. And you take a look at the access there, the, the time horizons there is in the past. So what happened? Just simple reporting. Um, diagnostic or why did it ha happen? So this gets into kind of uh, discovery type programs. And you, you hear a lot of process mining also making this analogy of discovering you know, business processes, why? One thing that is kind of unique to AI, although it's starting to see some of this in um, a process mining, is the predictive analytics, it is trying to predict through historical uh, data you know, what is likely to happen. And uh, I do see this in process mining as well, is this term of uh, prescriptive analytics. Given the information we have, what should we do? So uh, I know I, I can't see people out there or, or comments out there, so I'm gonna have to guess or second guess uh, what you might think, but um, hopefully um, some of you have seen this movie um, called Moneyball. And if you haven't, I urge you to see it. It's a fun movie um, and, and it talks about the conceptions that people have in trying to manage a baseball team. 
And, and so he, here's the scenario. Um, uh, where the bottom of the ninth, bases loaded, two out, who would you send to pinch hit? Now, baseball, and I, I suppose all sports, are well known for keeping a lot of statistics. And data science is science for trying to identify those variables that might affect performance or predictors here. So common statistics that were captured and, and still captured today over the years are things like batting average, home runs, runs batted in. So one might think that uh, you might want uh, Jose to be your lead batter there because he's got the highest batting average. Or perhaps you want Austin because he's got the most runs batted in. Now, if you saw the movie Moneyball, you, you'll, you'll know what the answer is to this. And, and you'll have uh, um, many people arguing uh, you know, based on the statistics they have to support their argument. But what they found over time is that they really weren't capturing or looking at the right statistics. The statistics they should have been looking on is the on-base percentage, is how often that person gets onto base. Because if that person gets onto base, eventually what happens is more runs are scored because of that. And, and, and the, you use this concept so that if you have, let's say, a Babe Ruth type player on your team who has you know, an incredible um, average, probably an on-base percentage, it's very difficult and very difficult to afford uh, another Babe Ruth. And so what they did was they decomposed the player to say, what is the person's on-base percentage? And if it's 0 0.402, like, like mine is, uh, what you could do is decompose that and say, let's get two players put together and gives us that 0 0.402. And we might even have money left over. And that's what the Oakland A's found out. And so that slide on the right is they made it to the World Series, but that little bar shows that they had one of the lowest uh, payrolls in all major leagues compared to the Yankees. So uh, typically, you know, the more you pay, the more you win. But they were able to prove uh, by looking at this predict this this on base percentage, they completely revolutionized the game here. Um, and, and to this day, if, if you are a baseball fan, if you caught the World Series last year, and uh, let me see, who was it again? Uh, the Dodgers versus the Tampa Bay Rays. Tampa Bay Rays has the third lowest payroll. We get a lot of people who, who don't even go to the games. Uh, and uh, and uh, the Dodgers had the second highest uh, payroll and, and uh, second only to, to the Yankees. And so um, if you, you saw the World Series, then you know probably where I'm going with this. Uh, game one, um, the Dodgers won. Game two, Tampa Bay won. Game three, the Dodgers uh, got ahead of two games, and then um, Tampa Bay tied it up again, two games apiece. Game, three, game five was won by um, the Dodgers. Now, game six was a pivotal game. They had to tie it up to push it to a game seven. They put their, their, their best pitcher, a southpaw, and he started striking people out like, like crazy, uh, under 100 pitches. And then in the, uh, I think it was the sixth inning, they took out their star pitcher. And they put in uh, another pitcher. And uh, in six pitches later, they lost the game. They were leading 1-0. The, everybody next day was wondering why on earth did you pull out your star pitcher? He, he, he wasn't even, he was way under a hundred pitches. Um, and, and what, why, and he had such momentum. And he, the, the coach never really said why he, he, he really, he just said, well, I thought he did enough, but the folks who follow analytics noticed this, they were at the top of the batting lineup. And the guy who was about to bat was, the, was going to be his fourth time uh, facing the pitcher. And the trend is, the statistics show that a batter facing a, a pitcher for the fourth time 
is batting will really improve. So the concern was that, hey, we struck him out three times, but the fourth, he's going to hit. And they took out the pitch. And that's the theory, and I think it is the correct theory that a lot of the baseball writers said. And the headlines read that, you know, the geeks rule baseball now. So um, it's out there. It's fundamentally changed the game. And it's not just the data side, it's the process side as well. So um, what makes AI a little different here? So there's some terms of, uh, I'll introduce here. Um, so again, for AI, we're trying to mimic uh, human intelligence here. And machine learning is uh, the set of algorithms at our disposal to use. Deep learning is a special kind of algorithm. It's trying to uh, mimic uh, you know, how the brain works with neurons and you have multiple levels. So that is kind of um, unique about AI. And, and in the bottom right-hand corner, think of it as your traditional programs, you, you, you feed it data uh, and a program, have a computer process it and you get an output. In machine learning, what you're really doing is the output is a prediction program. You feed it data, you tell it what uh, you like it to predict, and the computer figures out the algorithms. And that's your, the output is the model in, in, to, in producing these predictions. Uh, what, what's also a little different about here, and again, this is behind the scenes, is um, the compute platform for this. Uh, on the far left-hand side, we have traditional compute uh, CPU platforms, um, well-serviced by Intel and AMD. And then this uh, newer firm called NVIDIA, this is being well known for screens, uh, you know, high powered gaming screens. But graphical processing units are, are well suited because they perform uh, vector operations really well. And if you have a background in linear algebra, deep learning algorithms uh, are basically just an advanced linear programming. So um, they do this very fast and in parallel. FPGAs, fuel programmable gate arrays, are um, specialized uh, processors. You can read code at the firmware level, and there are, are a couple offerings out there. I see this usually uh, in a couple industries, uh, automotive, retail. But on the right-hand side here, uh, ASIC processors, advanced or uh, ASIC. Uh, these are optimized processors that, that do deep learning really well. And so in a Tesla car, you, you'll have this for to do a computer vision, et cetera. So um, these are the chips where all the startup capital is going, and they're building these into IoT devices. And you're seeing them also in uh, new kinds of servers. Um, so if you're following this field, you may have heard of a chip manufacturer called GraphCore. So um, they're, they're attempting to challenge NVIDIA to develop a server based chip to do deep learning really well. Application specific integrated circuit, that's it. So, okay. so um, when you go to IT and let's say you're trying to do process mining, today um, you know, it, it, it can be, uh, let's say a simple operation if it's just one application you're looking at. So on the far left-hand side, you know, you'll have uh, ERP data or, or logs, event logs, et cetera here. That's the, the data that you're really trying to do with process mining. This, though, if you're an IT uh, organization, is you want to build a platform that can really host for all kinds of analytics here. So the big picture is that you want all types of logs, et cetera, to be able to be ingested. Uh, and then what happens is that data gets curated in the middle here where, where um, you have things like data warehouses, you try to consolidate it, you clean the data. And then to the right of that, typically what the best practice is to build a consumption zone, meaning uh, a data platform that's optimized for performance to service uh, all the users on the right. So um, <clears throat> best practice is to build, uh, some people call this a data lake, a data platform, but something that is optimized for analytics. So uh, a couple of uh, examples just to uh, differentiate uh, kind of what uh, 
AI can do here. So um, all the credit card companies, you know, Visa, Amex, MasterCard have AI algorithms for fraud detection. They take a look at historical data and try to find patterns of what the, the bad people will do once they have a credit card. So um, probably you've experienced this like myself, is uh, sometimes if a stereo, that is one of the, I guess, most popular items, if a stereo pops up as uh, something you paid with a credit card, I've, I've had multiple times, <laughs> credit card company call, is that really you? Did you really buy uh, a new uh, stereo? I said, yes, that, that was me. Um, more sophisticated algorithms that uh, I've seen, um, and I had a person in one of my, um, uh, seminars come to me and say, hey, I had them ask me, you know, was this you who used this? Because you want to try to avoid false positives. And what this person did was I uh, presented in um, the capital of um, Ottawa and he used the credit card to buy something here. Um, it's just a snack. And then he was driving home to Montreal and midway he stopped by to fill up with gas and it got rejected. And he called the credit card company and said, what gives? He said, uh, I was I used it earlier this morning and now I'm here filling gas and it's not working. And they said, uh, well, according to our records, yes, you did use it this morning, but where you fill up gas, there's no physical way that you really should be there at that time. And he laughed and he said, okay, you got me. So he was a, uh, Feeding, um, fortunately, uh, not, not too too uh, reckless, but um, yeah, he was feeding quite a bit. And if you've ever been to Montreal, you'll know that that's not an uncommon thing. So they can get very sophisticated, these algorithms. Um, and the slide I had before, some of the use cases that you'll see for uh, AI or deep learning is uh, computer vision. And so to uh, improve supply chain, this uh, little robot that you see uh, learns the layout of a warehouse and can make deliveries. And they have uh, versions of this with arms so you can pick up things in the warehouse, place it down yourself and deliver it to another part. And these are perfect applications that can get integrated with RPA type applications, something that is very repetitive. Um, so lots of opportunities for, for these technologies to work uh, in concert. So um, now some of the challenges that we have, and there are plenty, while, while everybody says this is great, this is not an easy task. So uh, here um, when we see some paradoxes I'll point out. So on one hand, people are saying we need more data, we need more data. And on the other hand here, you know, even more people are saying we can't handle it, we can't handle the data. Um, and, and part of the problem, a big contributor is when you get into analytics, you need people who are educated uh, about analytics. And so here, 61% here in our survey with Forrester said that many are held back because of insufficient training, 57% um, insufficient skills. And yet while they say this is all important, you know, just very small percentage of companies are actually doing anything about it. To, to hire um, data experts. And you don't have to be a, a, a data scientist um, to, to do these things. Uh, what's emerging in the industry are what I call citizen data scientists. So people who are well-versed in an application and what data it uses. And you know they're, they're somewhat technical. Um, and all you do is you provide them the tools. And more and more, you'll see application development in this area where you don't have to code in you know, raw Python. It'll be uh, uh, components that you'll just assemble and put together. Uh, a best practice is always to build a strategy. And um, if you are an enterprise architect, you'll recognize these steps of defining your vision, you know, assessing your environment, creating what we call what the art of the possible is, and then <clears throat> defining a roadmap on how to get there, kind of low hanging fruit to get there first, uh, and, and the business case. And then finally, uh, governance. And, and this is where uh, the data privacy, data security uh, should be designed from the start. 
And, and here for your reference, these data science um, best practices and challenges all apply to uh, process mining as well. You want to try to get data that's clean, you want to avoid silos, uh, be nice to incorporate enhanced data by leveraging other sources of data. And the more advanced applications I see is uh, applications that, that can leverage near real-time data. And again, privacy, security, ethics, solubility, very important. So this is my last slide. Um, and <clears throat> as I mentioned before, uh, what we can do to prepare, and the most important thing is to have a data-driven culture. Right? Uh, it, it's not just a technology problem. You really have to be you know, fact-driven organization and the leading uh, companies uh, you know the internet companies they are very um, data driven uh, you take a look at uh, uber netflix etc they are hungry to process data to better understand their customers um, avoid data silos and again <clears throat> successful technology architectures have a focus on both the data and the processes involved here and so it's it's not one without the other. You you really need both of them. Both of them have to be looked at. So um, <clears throat> that's uh, it for my presentation here. Fantastic, Bill. It's always a masterclass when it comes to artificial intelligence and digital technologies and the data science. So we had questions coming from the audience um, on a different uh, um, different areas that you cover during your presentation here. And as I scan and look for the overall themes, continue to pose the questions to, to Bill here, and I'll relay as many questions as possible in the time that we have allotted. Uh, the first question has to do with uh, building the right skill sets in the organization. Um, you know, data science is, is a big field, and uh, when you... When, as you're build, as you're trying, as you mentioned very well, um, you you need to work on culture. You need to become more data driven in the organization. And then, as you start building infrastructure to support that journey, um, what kind of skills are you should be looking at in your data scientists? Uh, maybe technical skills, but maybe some of the uh, soft skills as well. How how do you screen for data scientists in this day and age? Uh, it's an uh, interesting question because we, we were, I get involved in um, uh, hiring at Dell, so we do look at um, certain skills and there's no, um, let's say, uh, uniform template. Um, uh, I'll start uh, with the, uh, the hard skills first. Yes, it's good to have um, uh, uh, in data science. Um, you know, it's funny. I I didn't take statistics. I I I, I didn't consider it a real you know mathematics. I I have a mathematics background. So, um, and for um, the 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 raw deep learning, it's good to have a math background. But you don't necessarily have to have a computer background. I've seen institutions where they take a physics major, and they enhance and train them, and he became their data scientist. I've seen organizations where they say, look, <clears throat> I don't ever want to code, but I think I can become a citizen data scientist. I, I know what the important data is. I know how to use it. I need somebody else just to get me that data. So yeah, there's no, um, let's say one profile for that. Um, but for the soft skills, I think that's equally important. Um, a lot of people I've seen <clears throat> at the beginning of uh, AI, they are hiring university and, and uh, masters and PhDs right out of school, giving them $300,000 to say, hey, uh, develop this AI project. Um, and some succeeded, but many did not. They didn't have the soft skills of, like how to co communicate, how to work in teams. Um, uh, and I think those are e equally, sometimes equally, if not more important, because you can't do this alone. It, it is, it's too big um, and uh, too complex for one person to do it. And you don't want to do it alone. You want the information 
the knowledge to be democratized over as many uh, people. So uh, yes, we, we want somebody who's good technically, but we also want uh, uh, good soft skills in a team environment. Um, for sure, you know that that's well well said. Uh, they, it's uh, it, it does require interdisciplinary skills um, and hard skills for sure, and the right soft skills, collaborative leadership skills to go with that. Um, um, I will I will let's let's shift the, the the conversation a bit towards Moneyball. And uh, first of all, I'm deeply hurt that I didn't make the first choice on the selection of the team, but you made the right decision. You you found a cheaper player with a better on-base percentage, and that should be the person you go for. <laughs> and uh, now it's interesting. Um, I I've actually worked with Billy Bean before. You know the 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 guy behind <laughs> the implementation at the Oakland A's. And if you talk to Billy Bean about that. He will tell you that the data science is very important, but it was not the most important thing because the when he first implemented Moneyball in the Oakland A's, it didn't work because the data was right, but the manager would not follow what the data says, which is a so-called process owner. Uh, so he didn't have a buy-in from the process owner. He had the key influencers in the organization, which was a specific player in the clubhouse who made way more money than everybody else was not on board. So even though he was told that he should pay, play in a certain way based on the model, he didn't. He really found very smart ways of sabotaging it. And because he was a key influencer in the clubhouse, the other players were looking at him for his behavior instead of the directions from the data. So this shows the complexity of things. Even if you have the right data set and even the data science behind it is sound, uh, the implementation doesn't work if you don't get people to accept it, right? Um, so um, highlights again the importance of what you just said about those those we we need to understand how change happens in organizations and bring those skills to data science. Um, now it's hard because we're asking you know people to be really good at the hard stuff and the really good at the soft stuff. And uh, it's not easy to find those people, right? I mean, I think there is uh, there there is a there is a, a real gap in the marketplace right now for for the combination of the skill sets. Is that is that how you see it as well? That it's a real challenge to find those people and mm -hmm. then attract them. Yes. Um, first, thank you for sharing that story about Billy Bean. Um, and when I watch that movie too, I, I think the thing I get most out of it is. Um, the cultural battle they, they had to get this. And I just want to narrate um, why it's so important to have that data culture. You, you can have the science there in front of them, but unless people buy in, and, and buy in is a soft skill, a soft sell, and, and it's unfortunate. And, and we see a lot of people fail because they, they can't get the right people on board. Um, yeah. There is, <laughs> and, and, there is Bill, you know, this is such a great, important conversation because there is this perception, especially from, you know, I'm an engineer at heart. I understand this. I'm, a, you know, I'm a physics and engineer guy. So, and we all are hardwired in school, in college specifically, to think that data is, is, is right, you know, science is sound and everybody will kind of follow along. But they don't, and I think COVID-19 is a great example of that. You can, you know, don't bother me with the facts. I've made up my mind. Is a real thing in organizations, and uh, so I'm I'm glad you brought this up in the context of process mining and artificial intelligence because these are some of the real hurdles of getting things implemented. Yeah, it is hard, but it it can be transformative. The, the advantage of process based. Um, like BPM, RPA, it's very easy to say, listen, if I cut out two processes here, make this more efficient, I'm going to save you X percent. Very simple. And then the science isn't that difficult to understand. So it's easy to get buy-in. Now, if I told you, well, customers might feel better, then they might buy, or the quality of your decisions will be better. That is not easy to cost justify. And a lot of people will come up with another argument and say, well, I don't think that'll happen. I think this will happen. Um, so while the benefits can be enormous, 
the challenge of adopting is is equally challenging here. So, and, and to get to the back to the skills, I, I find organizations too are are they they, they put out these uh, ads for people, but when they come to the organization, they're, they're only paid to do one task well. And unfortunately, <clears throat> what we find is the the, the people who can disrupt and change things, that they look beyond the, the silo that they're in. And unfortunately, people don't get paid for that. People aren't compensated for that. And then a lot of times they're penalized for that. They say, hey, you're, you're going out of your swim lane here. So to be able to have a comprehensive perspective, I think is absolutely necessary, but there's not a lot of rules that are asked to do that. Uh, one exception perhaps might be um, an enterprise architect who's asked to look at the business, uh, asked to look at technology, to ask to look at an application perspective. But outside of that, like even the data people said, hey, you, you, we just want you to look at the data. We, we got the process folks here, they're gonna look at that. But if you wanna optimize this and really transform how the business operates, you need somebody or people to look across. And, and companies don't pay for that. And we don't train people like that. You kind of have to learn this on the fly. Bill, what you have just shared, I'm going to go back and I'm going to record this segment over <laughs> and over again in a playback because that is gold. For the less experienced ones watching this, they may not have understood the depth of what you just said. But if you have been around for a few decades and seen how organizations actually work and how impl successful implementation of technology and culture change takes place, what you have just said is what the counter of that is what great enduring organizations do in a very structured way. They'll call the things like 20% time when you're expected to get out of your little bubble and go across the organization and find something that that actually will collaboratively create this proportional value. Um, and, uh, and then it's structurally doing something to counter this force that you just mentioned that is so critical. Uh, well, we can talk so much just about that. I want to ask you a technical question related to artificial intelligence right now to wrap up the segment and just finish with that with that tone. Well, maybe technical, maybe a bit more um, the strategic as well. Um, AI has been hyped a lot. And when you get in behind the scenes and you're using it, sometimes people are using multivariate regression analysis and they think it's AI. It's all like, come on, people. You know, what is the cognitive thinking that's going on there? So there has been a lot of hype on AI and misattributions related to AI. Where are we at today? Is it, I mean, we know lots of use cases and lots of applications that happen our day to day, with even of our phones. But do you think that it's still being hyped too much or it's this is the time we, we have gotten to the place where we just need to go exponential on the applications because it's ready for prime time? I think uh, <clears throat> it's still being overhyped. Uh, I think the technology right now is still in its infancy. So if you have an AI application that does something well, a lot of times the learnings of that cannot be transferred. So uh, let's take an example where um, Watson from IBM did really well in, in, at playing Jeopardy, but when they tried to take that technology and use it in healthcare, uh, they had lots of challenges and, and many would say they, they, they failed miserably there. So, um, but there are plenty of opportunities and we're at that point again where we, the science is there, but the people adopting it is the challenge. So there have been studies and one in Toronto where um, they, they, they come up to a radiologist and they say, uh, we want you to rate this recommendation. Now, what they don't know is um, sometimes the recommendation, uh, they, they were all done by a computer, but we told them uh, one, one group that it was done by a human, another group we told them it was done by AI. And they always ranked the human better even if they were incorrect so there are a lot of things still going on a lot of uh, mis um, perceptions of what ai is still so we're still in early days the science is still exciting there are still breakthroughs that are happening we still got a long ways to go <clears throat> 
often I still get questions on, you know, is uh, Skynet coming or anything like that? No, <laughs> plenty of years before that, um, we were still on the technical perspective, still in the early days. Adoption, lots of opportunity, but again, <clears throat> it's the, uh, the culture, the human aspects that we're having challenges with uh, right now. That's excellent. Bill, your presentations are always tremendous because you share market research that is so insightful. Uh, I'm I'm reflecting the comments and feedback and the and the praise from our audience that has been shared throughout this conversation. And I want to let you know that on behalf of our global community, we're deeply thankful for you to take the time and share your expertise, your insights, um, your your practical applications of uh, how AI can create value today and how we're gonna to continue to create value in the years to come. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Thanks very much. Have a good day, people. Thank you, Bill. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Bill Wong, uh, artificial intelligence and data analytics leader at Dell and uh, a real cross industry leader when it comes to artificial intelligence and digital technologies. Um, uh, always a pleasure if you play back this seg this session uh, pay careful attention to some of the data that bill has shared with us uh, there's some real um, uh, great insights built into that uh, data set that he shared with us so we are going to be wrapping up this session i encourage you to uh, check out on the on linkedin what speakers are saying what participants are saying about the conference questions that they have that they have brought up uh you can go under linkedin under my name jose Perez, and you'll see there my last feature post is the post about this conference and that's where everybody is making comments about what's going on here so if you're deriving value from this session make sure you go there thank our sponsors for allowing this to take place thanks our speakers to bring in their thought leadership uh, and being so generous with their skills and time and sharing that with us. We appreciate that. We're gonna wrap up here for a break. And when we come back, we're gonna come up with two industry leaders coming directly from Europe. We are talking about Mark McGregor, who is an author, performance and business coach on major digital transformations. And Sofia Pasova, who is the founder and president of Stereologic. And they're gonna talk to us about all that glitters is not gold. Why broadening your approach to process mining is the key to long-term success. Sessions with Mark are always intriguing and interesting, so I hope to see you at the top of the hour. <laughs>